And uh, firstly, thank you everybody from Busta for joining in. Um, this is our attempt to really show like how diverse our alumni community is and just like how diverse our community is and the topics that we actually bring forth can be like, you know, from academia to enrichment and, and from the mountains to the sea and people connecting in from different parts of the world. So firstly, a big thank you to Marie, who's an alumni and um, uh, who was also up here for her reunion recently. So uh, thank you, Marie, for just like showing the enthusiasm and uh, for actually organizing this session and to Simon and Getten who are part of the setup uh, to which Marie is the founder, which is called the Reefscapers. And um, I'm actually gonna hand the mic and the show over to them to introduce themselves and uh, take the next hour forward. And I'm actually really excited because we're actually gonna be diving like into the sea. So it's gonna be really cool. And I hope you all enjoy today's session because I have thoroughly enjoyed the rehearsals. So over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so my name's Simon, I'm here with uh, Gertan and we are in the Maldives at uh, Reefscapers, which is a um, marine discovery center where we have a variety of different uh, projects on the go. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start a little bit, just introduce ourselves briefly. We're then gonna hand over to uh, Marie. She's gonna introduce herself, tell you a little bit more about her background. Uh, and then what Getan and myself will do is we'll take you on a brief tour around the NDC and we'll try and intersperse it a little bit with some educational videos that we have which describe our projects um, and highlight to you the sort of conservation work uh, that we do here. Um, the idea behind that is just so you don't have to listen to Getan and myself for the next hour, which I'm sure wouldn't be too interesting, but we'll show you some videos as well. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm the manager here at the Marine Discovery Center. I originally started as the coral biologist in 2018. Um, I have a bachelor's in marine biology and a master's degree in conservation. Um, I can say to you that marine biology was always my passion. It was something which um, I wanted to get involved in from a very young age. Um, but it wasn't until I dipped my toe in the water that I really realized the diversity of the marine biological field. Um, I was able to then specialize and decide that uh, coral reefs was really what I wanted to be involved in. Um, and I was lucky enough, as I said, to join Reefscapers in 2018. My name is Gaetan, I'm French and um, I'm 27 years old. Um, so when I was in France, I, I grew up there, I did all my studying there. Um, when I graduated from high school, I really had no idea what to do, but I had some good grades in math and physics, so I went into engineering school. And uh, during my studies, then I realized that I wanted to work uh, to, in environmental conservation. So that's why now I'm working here, um, especially in marine biology, which I find super interesting. And um, for me, it was a bit tricky to shift from engineering school to marine biology, but it's also it's also good because it's, uh, I have some skills that are a bit rare in this field. So it's also a nice way to study something different and get into a different field later. And I think um, I can speak for the whole team that we all come from a very diverse background. Um, from England, such as myself, uh, we have Aku, who's our system manager. Uh, he's Moldavian national, Getan is French. We have our turtle veterinarian here who is from Mexico. Um, so we're really a, a very diverse team. Um, we'll hand over now to Marie, who will be able to tell you a little bit more uh, about her background and a little bit more about Reefscapers. Thank you, guys. Um, so uh, I think I'll go to when I graduated from Woodstock. But before that, I was living in the Maldives all my life. And so I went from the lowest, lowest to the highest, highest point. And I have to say I was a bit lost. Like, you know, you sort of don't know how to, you know, what, what to even wear. Like, you know, you've grown up near the beach your whole life. And then you go oh, to the Himalayas. And I remember even having hypothermia on the first hike. Anyway, um, so after I graduated from Woodstock, I went back to the Maldives, worked for three years in the government at the Marine Research Center. And at the same time, um, I was applying for scholarships. And so I did my undergraduate in marine biology at the James Cook University in Townsville in Australia. Um, went back to the Maldives after my degree and joined the Marine Research Center again. 
And so then I started working with the coral reef team there. And I did my master's again in the same, the same university in Townsville um, in uh, protected area management. So it gave me two perspectives. So the monitoring and the data collection, data analysis, report writing, and the other one was more management. So what, how we work is like these guys, um, they collect a lot of data and we have, you know, get on here using that data to put it to good use, for example. I mean, he's helping us collect a lot of data as well using robots. So um, it's all about management, right? Managing people. Um, and I mean, you can't really manage the environment. You have to manage the people and the activities that happen in the environment to manage the environment itself. So um, we founded, uh, so it was initially called CMARC in 2000, and it's now Reefscapers. Um, and we've got uh, marine biologists based in, at, two, uh, at the two Four Seasons at the Marine Re Discovery Center. So these guys are going to show you what it is and the projects we're, gonna, we're doing. Um, I just want to say, because this is coming through the Center for Imagination and Amy is one of my classmates who founded the CFI. And I'm so proud of her. And I think it's amazing in that everybody should have a center, even the adults, right? Because half the time we don't know what we're doing and um, it will be great to explore, you know, what we want to do. There's so much to do. There's so many options, right? So all those of you who are wondering, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to study? Don't worry at all because there's a whole lot of things you can do. And once you start getting out into the real world, you will find so many things um, to do. So, for example, my son, who's just finished high school, he wanted to do genetic engineering. So he was going to go to London to do genetic engineering. But because of COVID, he ended up going to France um, because he's also French. And because um, the education is free over there and cheaper. Um, and now he wants to go into computer studies and programming and stuff. So you see within like six months, he's sort of realized genetic engineering is not what he wants to do. So I think it's great if all of you, you know, I know it's worrying for a lot of you, but just to take it easy and not worry too much. Like Simon also said, you know, like we've all through our experiences, you know, it adds on and you sort of change what you do. I now work on shark conservation um, and I work with governments in the region, uh, a lot on the CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. And that's how we try to implement monitoring of uh, shark fisheries and the shark catchers. So, you know, lots to do. And um, I'll hand over to Simon and Geton. Um, and at the end, I mean, we'll try to answer any questions you guys might have. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you Marie. As um, Marie just said, at the end, we'll do uh, obviously a little question and answer. But what Geton and I will try and do now is just give you a little bit of an insight into the Marine Discovery Center that we have here. This center is obviously the base for us to conduct our research but it's also uh, what we would consider guest facing. So the center is based within a resort in the Maldives. So the visitors to the hotel also have access to our Marine Discovery Center. They can come in, they can talk with the biologists here. Um, they can get involved in some of the conservation initiatives that we do. And we also look to uh, provide some sort of education to them as well. So what we'll do now, and you'll have to excuse us if we have a bit of shoddy camera work, but we're gonna get up with the laptop and we're gonna walk you around the, the center a little bit um, give you some idea of the projects and then like I said we'll intersperse that with a little bit of video all right so if the camera's bad blame Getan. <laughs> um, so as you can see as we walk around we have a variety of different uh, touch screens with some informational material as well um, and that is dedicated to each of our sections so coral restoration turtle rehabilitation and then we do our aquaculture which is breeding of fish um, and we also have some other projects such as uh, dolphin ID and we do what's called marine life database. So when we're in the water, we record species that we see, um, sex them and uh, record any sort of behaviors as well, which of course then leads to an overall picture of the marine life that we have here in the Um Here we have our big jellyfish display. Um, so these jellyfish were all bred in-house and they're moon jellyfish, um, Aurelia orata, found in most of the oceans around the world. 
Um, you can see the funky colors which is given off by the light. And this is a real draw for the guests. They love to come in here and ask us lots of questions about these guys. Um, and we always try and give them that, that well-known fact that a lot of jellyfish are actually immortal. They're capable of uh, regressing in their growth phase back down to the polyp stage. Moving around towards the front. Um, and this is one of our main educational tools. Uh, so this is our main aquarium. The idea behind this is that we can give people a snapshot of the mollusks. So this is right as you walk into the door, you are hit with this big aquarium. Every species that you find in here is found in the mollusks. So we have a variety of fish um, alongside some invertebrates, such as our little lobster. You might just be able to see the little tentacle poking out of the rock there. Um, and then we have our more famous residents, such as our clownfish. So here we'll talk about in a minute your clarks and enemy fish. And then we have our Moldavians down here as well. This is a great tool for us, um, especially when we run school groups. Um, a lot of the Maldivian nationals, um, especially the girls, are not particularly familiar with the marine environment. They're not given the opportunities. They don't jump in the water and snorkel. Some of them can't even swim. So when we get our school groups coming through, this is a great way to show them what is literally on their doorstep. Um, then there are some programs which are run, which encourage the, the girls and the boys to get in, to learn how to swim, to learn to snorkel, and give them that connection um, to really what is their livelihood, what is essential for them to survive here in the mountains. As we move through, we'll have a little look at our aquaculture. Um, so the idea behind our aquaculture is to take uh, fish species and breed them. So here we have our uh, clarks and enemy fish. Yes, I'm doing a great job with the camera there. Um, so these little guys are actually bred, captive bred uh, in-house. And the reason for this is there are uh, a lot of pressures on fish stocks within um, the ocean. So especially since films like Finding Nemo, a lot of people want to take clownfish and have them in their home aquariums. Um, essentially what happens there is people go into the wild and they'll collect the fish and then they'll sell them. So obviously we're decreasing the wild stocks. What we aim to do here is twofold. We aim to breed these fish in an aquarium setting to either release out into the ocean to boost the populations um, or to provide to the aquarium trade. But what we would really like to do with this particular venture is to be able to go into local communities and teach these techniques um, to local Maldivians so that A, they have uh, an alternative source of livelihood, but also as a secondary source, and they're also taking those pressures away uh, from uh, the natural populations. We'll show you a little bit of a video on that in a second. But what I want to do now is just walk around into our fish lab. So our fish lab is where we produce all of our food for our aquariums. <laughs> yes, Anne's doing great. So in our fish lab, um, we, as I said, produce all of our live food. Um, so essentially, we start from the bottom up. So bottom of our food cycle would be our algae production. And you can see just behind Getan here down on the shelves, we have all of our algae bottles. So this is all um, created in-house. Um, we use, uh, obviously, fertilizers to encourage growth and then provide a lot of light. Um, we have big tubs out the back where we grow these strains of algae, which are then used to feed the next step up in the, uh, the food chain, which would be our plankton stages, which are rotifers. Now, I would try and show you the rotifers, but they're so small, it's just going to look like a, a bucket of water that I'm going to show you. But essentially, we cultivate those to then feed to our juvenile clownfish. Obviously, um, when our clownfish are born, their mouths are simply not big enough to take either dried prepared foods or other types of foods, such as our teeny or brine shrimp, which we'll show you in a minute. So we have to feed them a smaller food source. Um, they'll start on the algae and then they'll progress through to the rotifers, to that microplankton. And then as they grow, they'll move on to what's called brine shrimp. So some of you may have heard of sea monkeys. Um, it used to be quite a common thing to keep as a pet, especially when I was a little boy and uh, I know a lot of other people have as well, but that's essentially what we have here in their brine shrimp. So they're freeze dried. Um, we get them dried and we um, uh, hydrate the eggs and then we grow them through their various life stages. So again, as they grow through their life stages, we're providing the clownfish with different sizes of foods which they can eat. So what we'll do now is we'll show you a little video which will basically go through that process. You'll see a breeding pair of clownfish, the eggs, the larval stage, and then through to the grower. And then we'll move on to turtles, all right? So just bear with us a second and get on and I will start the little video for you. 
Let's see if I can remember which one. All right. Uh, the audio might be a little loud, guys. Um, these videos are obviously pre-prepared, so just you might want to turn down your volume. So just a, a little idea there of some of our clownfish breeding. Um, you can see the eggs through the larvae stage and then obviously through to the different growth stages. Um, one of our more popular elements, or certainly one of the ones we get the uh, most engagement out of is our total rehabilitation program. Um, here in the Maldives, especially this time of year, um, we find a lot of injured uh, turtles, um, predominantly uh, olive ridleys. Um, and these guys are um, found in what's called ghost nets. So a ghost net is essentially a discarded uh, fishing net or a fishing net which is broken off of a vessel. Um, and those nets unfortunately continue to do their job in the ocean. Um, oftentimes you'll find these turtles will come to those nets looking for food, looking for shelter, uh, and unfortunately they become entangled in the nets. So a lot of the patients that we find here suffer from a variety of different illnesses through to amputation of flippers, um, and also what is commonly called buoyancy syndrome. Um, there's not a huge amount known about buoyancy syndrome, but essentially what it means is that the turtles are floating at the top, um, which means they can't dive and can't feed themselves. Um, the treatment of it is incredibly difficult. Um, usually it results in uh, waiting until the air is naturally dissipated from underneath their shell. But obviously here at the rehab center, we have an on-site vet um, who is able to provide top-notch care for these animals with the ultimate goal of releasing them back into the ocean. Um, last year, we had our 10-year uh, anniversary of our turtle rehab center, which was fantastic. Um, but obviously, we do find patients as well which are unable to be released. For those particular patients, because we are a rehab center, not a zoo, not an aquarium, we have to look for alternative methods to give them the best quality of life we possibly can. And for that, we developed a program called the Flying Turtles. And what we do with this program is for our long-term patients or indeed our patients, which we think can't be released, we send them to zoos and aquariums around the world where they can um, essentially live out the rest of their life um, in a, a far more suitable environment, but also act as ambassadors for their species. 
In other words, people visiting those zoos and aquariums will be able to learn a little bit more about why this turtle is floating. Um, and of course, then uh, learn a little bit more about some of the pressures which these animals are facing, like ghost nets, for example. So what we have now is a little documentary about um, our flying turtle program. Um, and this is gonna highlight um, essentially the process of our rehab patients at the center and then the travel through to their, their permanent home. Um, so we'll show that one to you now. It is a very exciting day for the juvenile sea turtle named Zaya. After spending over four years at the Four Seasons Landa Giravaru Sea Turtle Rehabilitation Center, Zaya and three other members of the turtle family will be leaving abroad for further medical treatment. Flying turtles is the result of abundant marine debris found in our oceans, especially fishing nets, causing entanglement and more commonly named ghost nets. Negative impacts of the evolving technology and other developing advancements are causing large and irreversible damage to mother nature. Extensive human development around the world is degrading the water quality of the oceans and threatening marine life. Maldives, a country surrounded by water, cannot ignore this fact. Irresponsible dumping of waste in addition to poor management and monitoring of the same has left a number of marine life under the threat of extinction. The Marine Discovery Center, NDC at Four Seasons Landagi Ravaru, is a joint effort between Seamark and the resort itself to rehabilitate and rejuvenate the victims of such man-made environmental vulnerabilities. Here on the island uh, with our team of Seamark marine biologists, we are conducting several marine conservation projects, uh, such as our coral propagation project, one of the most successful of its kind, our fish lab project, which is our ornamental fish breeding. Uh, this is as well a pioneering project here in the Maldives. And we also have a turtle rehabilitation center. We opened this center uh, in 2011 and we did it because A, we were very interested in, um, in the nature and the underwater world of the Maldives and it's a great opportunity to also um, educate kids and adults from all over the world about the natural wonders of this country. So Seamark and Four Seasons teamed up in 2011 in response to depleting sea turtle numbers here in the Maldives, but then also finding a whole bunch of sea turtles that were entangled in nets and injured, and thus brought back to health before their release. And through this, we developed the Maldivian Sea Turtle Conservation Program. So we have the nest protection program, in which we go out to local islands and try to teach people that having sea turtles in the wild is very important. They're an indicator species, and whatever happens to them is kind of just showing the health of the ocean. So if they're healthy, the ocean's healthy. And right now we know that the ocean isn't very healthy because sea turtle populations aren't either. Another thing that we do is sometimes we take the weak hatchlings in these nests and we rear them until they're about 30 centimeters and release them back to the wild. Again, because these are the turtles that probably wouldn't have survived at all. And by taking them and raising them to a size of 30 centimeters, they're less likely to become predated upon and more likely to become adults and help out the population. Um, another thing that we do with our sea turtles that we rehabilitate is we put satellite tags on them. These are really high-tech tags that can track the turtles after they leave us. We want to know where these turtles are coming from because we know that they're not getting entangled in nets that come from the Maldives, but they're coming from other places. So where are these sea turtles going that they're so most likely to become entangled in these nets? And so we use this data to kind of track it, and then hopefully it will go on a broader scale working with other countries and really trying to determine conservation areas. 
And then the last thing that we do and that we try to get everyone involved with is the sea turtle identification project. So if anyone's out in the reef snorkeling or diving, they can snap a photo of the turtle's face and then they can submit it to us via the Maldives Turtle ID program Facebook page. Another thing that we do is we take in injured or sick sea turtles that are found throughout the Maldives here and anyone in the Maldives can find one and give us a call and we'll take them in and help transport them around. And this is really important because these guys are usually entangled in nets and these nets have caused severe injuries. So a lot of these turtles are missing flippers or they're just really malnourished and they need to be um, cared for very well before they can go back to the wild. Another issue that they have is buoyancy, in which they float and they can no longer dive. They float at the surface, that means that they can't feed themselves and they'll most likely just starve over time. Genessa Mikola Hama, Wagutung treatment there and then an injury foot, Echevijiam Hama, Aitanta, Fahafa, and a Mulet Safo for Generun and a Varabo, Fehi Jahafa, Barnacles is Jahafo, and then a Huriachinata Safo, then Furtambalani Kato, Mukanyamu, and a Dedus for home, force feeding for another, force feeding cook gang, petty, and a rehabilitated for an. आमुको फेंड ना वेला तक की वावश वेला दे मीच से की राज्य का अनेंग हैं आमुको फेंड ना वेला इन्नो गिनफार मी फेंड ने हाँ बेरो का आमु तक को मी फेंड ना बोडे ती मास दालु के जेही के घर ना तंग मी फेंड ना मास दाले पुनी स्वार बोडे ती दा दालु के वाह का मी देखे वैनी दे मीच से की राज्य के बेरो को ऐसे अने प्लास्टिक में कोतलो कोतलो गया अने गोनी गोनी का जेही फोन ना तं बैंगे चेबोरे मारुए से फर जेही गेन वस NTC has so far released a number of victimized sea turtle back into home oceans under their dedicative efforts. However, some turtles are ailing and not fit to be released back, causing a raise of concern at the center. As a result, we have been releasing more than 80 turtles so far since 2011, but unfortunately, there are still six long-term residents under our care that are suffering from the floating syndrome. The floating syndrome um, is actually some air that is trapped under the carapace of the turtle, we don't know exactly where. It can happen for different reasons, and we are not able to get rid of this air right now at this stage here at our center. This is also the reason why we have to go forward with this research, and that is why we have decided to give these turtles away that other persons around the world will be able to conduct and continue our research. So after contacting several uh, zoos all around the world, uh, we made uh, contact with uh, Paradise Zoo in Belgium and uh, Aqua Zoo Friesland in the Netherlands and we started to work on the collaboration. We started working with this project 10 months ago so it took us a lot of time to organize everything. We started working with the Marine Discovery Center here because it's a very recommended food rescue center and Sorry for the animals that they are not releasable anymore, so they can go back to the ocean. So that's the reason why we decide to bring them to a zoo, so we can give them a better life in captivity, and take good medical care, and we can use them for the or plastic soup education program. The idea of this is uh, not only to give these turtles a new home, it's also uh, to continue our work here. So our research, our care for these animals uh, cannot be continued because we have lack of tools of machinery. So there we've uh, dedicated veterinarian professionals. Uh, they will be able to have extended care, uh, conduct x-rays, blood tests, and hopefully find um, something about this floating syndrome. The idea is when they will find something, they will be able to give us the information and hopefully we'll be able to treat 
future rescue turtles here at our center and as well in the Maldives. The idea is to share this information worldwide. The flontic syndrome identified in the four turtles is not yet curable at the MDC. However, with the news of overseas Paradise Zoo and Aqua Zoo of Friesland adoption of Zaya and her three friends, Kerry, Peggy and La Petite, light of cur is seen at the end of the tunnel. The zoo, they have uh, more than a million of visitors per year. There will be extended education as well. Uh, the, these turtles that we are sending, it's all, not only for them to have a bigger home, but they will be the ambassador of their species, of the olive ridley species. These turtles will be the first flying turtles out of the Maldives. They will also be the first olive ridley turtles to be represented in Europe. So this is also very important. So important education and awareness regarding these animals and regarding marine pollution will also take place. For their journey, Zaya and her three friends are given a VIP class travel experience that also includes occasional pampering. Sea turtles being marine reptiles, special attention is given to ensure that the four flying turtles are remain wet and warm throughout the long journey. Each turtle gets a wet pad in their customized crate. Their skin and shell gets covered with a thick layer of Vaseline at every transit and eye drops are administered to keep their eyes wet. Of course it was the first project uh, of its kind to send turtles abroad for donation rehabilitation program. So many steps have to go forward and we were lucky enough to add a strong support from the Maldivian government uh, to help us get all the certification and permits to make this happen. Bid the warm goodbye at Landa Giravaru, Zaya, Kerry, Peggy and La Petite had their crates inspected by well-trained professionals who ensured the perfect temperatures as the transit included the first stop at Ibrahim Nazir International Airport in Dubai, before the final lag to reach their new homes. <laughs> All four turtles arrived in excellent condition and were swimming in their new habitats later that evening. You can see uh, right now uh, the turtles arrived. They are in their final exhibit, their new home. Uh, it was of course a long trip for the animals, but as you can see now they have reached their new home. It's a nice uh, big exhibit, that plenty of space, uh, many fish as well. In the tanks, so a little bit more interaction. Uh, I think it's a really nice place. They will have more, uh, more space to swim around, etc. There are some parents as well, so they will be definitely more happy. Uh, of course, there's going to be a lot of visitors as well uh, coming here. They will be able to see the animals, ask questions about the origin. It's going to educate the people as well. So this is also something very important uh, for us to speak about these olive ridley turtles. The first in, uh, in Europe, actually. Uh, it's the first time that this has happened. Uh, olive ridley turtles shipped from the Maldives. So this is a very uh, special moment. Uh, for us, of course, and for the dogs, they're going to be the ambassador of the species and, uh, and share their story uh, here in, uh, in Belgium. Now it's going to be uh, told they have been here since uh, one day now, they're doing good. Uh, now we're going to do some x rays, have a look. Uh, what is inside their body exactly. Uh, typically they have this floating syndrome. Uh, we would like to know more about it. They have never been x-rayed, so it's going to be something uh, very new as well for us and hopefully we will have some explanation uh, from the veterinarian here. So uh, we are very uh, interested uh, about uh, the outcome of the, the x-rays. We decide that Zaya, Kerry, Peggy and La Petite 
will not return to the Maldives, but we know that they are safe and happy there in Paradisa and are receiving excellent medical care. What should not be ignored is that there are uncountable other victims of various species who are paying the price of irresponsible human actions. These four olive ridley turtles are somewhat the lucky ones, as they were found before time ran out. As the bravest living soul, it is the duty of human race to be responsible and save the planet for a brighter and better future for all living creatures. Okay guys, so that was just a, an insight into the Flying Turtle program. We actually had some success last year. Um, one of the turtles which was subjected to the Flying Turtle program, uh, Peggy, she actually started getting over her buoyancy syndrome. She actually started diving in her um, captive aquarium. So what they did was they got in contact with us and we actually shipped her all the way back to the Maldives, fitted her with a satellite tag and, and eventually she was able to be released into the wild. Is a fantastic story for her and of course a, a real testament to the zoo and aquarium as well which is great um the last thing that we want to talk about with you um is probably our biggest project um and it's certainly uh, something which getan and i are very passionate about and that's our coral restoration um so i was coral biologist here uh, from 2018 until last year uh, and getan was originally um, employed as the assistant coral biologist Essentially, what we do is we utilize the coral frame technology, which was pioneered by reefscapers um, in partnership with Four Seasons in uh, 2000. Um, and what we do is we take pieces of coral, attach them to uh, these frame structures to repopulate the reefs. Um, so the reefs here uh, in the Maldives and of course around the world are facing increasing pressure. Um, through climate change, we get um, events called coral bleaching events. And a coral is a plant and an animal living together. And essentially these warming waters or bleaching events cause a little fight between the algae and the animal. And it results in the algae being expelled from the coral. Now the algae is responsible for giving the coral its color. So once the algae is expelled, the coral turns white because the tissue essentially becomes see-through and you're looking through to the skeleton. Unfortunately for the coral, the animal, the plant provides around 90% of its food source through photosynthesis. So once that coral has lost its algal host, unless the stress such as the warmer water is, is reduced or taken away, that coral will eventually die. Um, the most recent bleaching event we had here in the Maldives was 2016, where around Lander alone, we lost around 90% of our coral reef. So our aim is to repopulate the reefs using corals which are left over. So we take those small fragments, as I said, live fragments, attach them to the frame and we grow new coral colonies. And Getan and I were fortunate enough last year to actually see some of the coral that had been outplanted onto the frames in our house reef actually spawning, um, so giving off eggs and sperm and, and reproducing onto the reef, which is a fantastic result for us. Um, so we'll start off with a, a little video um, with uh, Marie and Thomas, who are the founders of Reefscapers, um, and they'll talk a little bit about uh, some of their efforts um, in the Maldives here and, and a little bit more about the partnership between them and, uh, and Four Seasons. The coral is everything here in the Maldives. Right now we can say we've got still a lot of corals. They think that in 2050 already there won't be any. So that's not a very enticing prospect for anyone, I think. In the year 2000, we found ourselves in the aftermath of the El Nino, and 90% uh, of the corals in our house reef were dead. The reef was not looking good at all. We were having maybe 1% or 2% on the live coral cover. When Thomas from Seamark uh, came up with this uh, little frame and said, I think this might work, uh, we just said, let's, let's give it a shot and let's try it. Now we can employ people on this island to manufacture the frames that are sent to the resort. Having the frame building here is bringing in more ideas and more opportunities for the people. We can do a lot more things with the community. I wanted to see if I could actually 
try to develop some economic activity on such an island to encourage the people to stay and stick to their values. What they're doing is a big part of uh, awareness because this is where it starts. The frame starts here. We started with a few frames and now there are hundreds and actually thousands of them. We need to multiply this again by 10 or 20 because we are talking about 840 kilometers of coral reefs from the north to the south of Maldives. You just can't stand back and not do something when you can do something. If I can select some resistant individuals of different coral species, uh, hopefully I can postpone for a few years their forecast of death. So uh, this is uh, in Nafusi. The government has uh, listed to us and uh, we hope to build a marine center here. Thomas and Marie are a, an interesting element and addition to how we live here and how we work here. Him being the cool scientist, uh, us being the business, um, her being the Maldivian passionate about uh, her country and her reef and her people. It's really a symbiosis between Four Seasons and Seamark. I do organize workshops to work with the youth from the islands. It's fun to see that uh, when you embrace uh, an idea, uh, that you actually uh, are able to make a difference and, and, and things can improve and things can change and nature is stronger than people might think, you know. Nature can rejuvenate itself uh, if you give it a bit of hand. If we manage to keep the corals alive, then we will maintain the Maldives afloat. So let's see if we can do something about it. So it gives you an idea a little bit about the process that goes into it. Um, if I say to you that we uh, roughly estimate that in the 20 years we've been doing this, we've outplanted around half a million fragments of coral. Um, around the islands here alone in Atlanta, we have around 4,000 frames. And uh, Kuduhura, our sister island, we have uh, around another 3,000. Um, so we are a huge program um, of our type. Uh, we are one of the largest in the world. Um, so obviously with that sort of vast number of coral comes a vast number of work. Um, we believe that a huge gap within the restoration community at the moment is long-term monitoring. Um, we need to be able to record the data from our monitoring processes to see if we're successful. And if we're not successful, how can we adapt and adjust that to become successful? Um, so with that comes the process of taking uh, photos of our frames, every single frame, every six months, which is then recorded onto uh, a public facing database. We also engage the wider community so people are able to sponsor our frames. You can buy a frame for yourself. Um, and have your dedication, your own personalized number, which you can then follow over time on our website. So we'll show you a little bit now about the process, which includes some great video of Getan underwater. Um, we'll show you that and then I'll hand over to him and he'll talk to you a little bit more about um, how that monitoring is then uh, used.
So as you can see from that, um, it's quite a lengthy process from the initial uh, collection right the way through to the outplanning process. Um, as we said, we visit each frame every six months um, and take those photos. And we estimate we have around 275,000 photos, which is a great resource, but the difficulty comes in being able to withdraw the data from a picture. It's incredibly difficult to do. Um, but Getan will explain a little bit more to you about how he's gone about that process. Yeah, one of the um, biggest issue with coral restoration is um, it's quite a new field. So we have very little knowledge about it, scientific knowledge. So for instance, we, nobody knows which species do better, if it's better to put them deeper or shallower. This kind of data that would um, enable us making a more effective job. So um, here, since we have more than 15 years of experience, we have the potential to, to get all this information. But uh, as Simon said, it's a lot of pictures. And of course, it would be completely impossible to go through them manually and to write down which cause survived and which one died. So what I've been working on since uh, the last two years, it's um, to work on an um, artificial intelligence process that analyzes all these pictures. So it's going to detect all the core fragments automatically on the pictures they take their position on the frame. And then when there are new pictures six months later, we can see whether they are still alive, whether they grew and if they grew by how much. And then we can link that to all the environmental data, such as the depth, the species, and even the temperature. So now we have a little, another video to show you about this uh, process to explain what's happening. I apologize, this one has more of my voice in. I'm sure you're sick of hearing it. But... The plight of the coral reefs is one which has garnered a lot of attention, and justifiably so. Of all the ecosystems which are threatened by mankind's developments, coral reefs may likely be the first to become completely unrecognizable, if not disappear completely. 60% of reefs are already seriously damaged by anthropogenic factors. If we also consider rising ocean temperatures, this figure climbs to 75% of the world's reefs are considered under threat. Three years after the last major coral bleaching event, caused by prolonged high sea temperatures during the 2016 El Nino, reefs around the world are far from recovery. With the frequency and severity of bleaching events increasing, they may never fully recover. A catastrophic prospect for the 25% of all marine life supported by these ecosystems. Mortality due to rising sea temperatures seems inevitable. But is it? Reefscapers has been involved in coral transplantation projects in the Maldives for the last 18 years. Reflecting on the techniques of the day, the coral frame concept was developed and proved successful in a breakthrough moment for reef restoration. It has now been widely adopted by volunteers and researchers alike as a simple, cost-effective technique for coral propagation. To understand better coral growth and its resilience to climate change, we need to observe and record what's happening in the water. How fast are corals growing? Which species are the most successful? Which environmental factors should we monitor? One of the biggest challenges in coral research today is to gather enough of these observations to facilitate a meaningful change on a global scale. Logistical gains and sponsorship enabled reefscapers to deploy many frames and grow numerous coral colonies. As these frames are regularly monitored, Reefscapers is now in possession of over 175,000 pictures of the different structures and their coral inhabitants, painstakingly gathered by the different coral biologists working on these projects. These pictures revealed that shading of the structures resulted in an increased chance of colony survival. Rather than moving the structures to deeper depths in search for absent, cooler water, existing overwater structures are used to prevent irradiation during the critical temperature events. But you can have millions of pictures. They are worthless if you don't know how to extract the invaluable information they contain. At Reefscapers, we use state-of-the-art artificial intelligence to identify core fragments as such and monitor them individually. They will provide us with enough data on core growth and resilience to help global restoration efforts take the most successful path. The wealth of information contained within the photographic database alongside the success of a preliminary artificial intelligence algorithm implementation, has led Reefscapers to embark on a full-scale artificial intelligence and automated monitoring program. This initiative is designed to gather and analyze large amounts of data. 
The solar-powered catamaran is designed to locate itself through GPS and appreciate the local context through cameras and computer vision algorithms, while providing an underwater live feed. It will visit the frames regularly to continue previous monitoring techniques. This methodology relied on manual collection by the coral biologists, who due to time constraints were limited in the number of observations they could make. In addition to increasing the monitoring frequency, the data collection will also be more consistent, which would improve the process and yield more robust results. Consensus within the scientific community predicts that the coral reefs of the world have a lifespan which can be measured in tens of years. It's within this time frame that we are seeking to delay and prevent their extinction. There is simply no time to lose to develop and deploy the tools derived from the latest enhancements in information technology, which have proved useful in a number of other sectors. Together, let's make sure we're ready for the next El Nino and prepared for the future. So there you can see just a, a brief outline. Um, and actually we are uh, the first people in the world to be employing such techniques to identify the coral to a species level. Um, we're working, or Getan is working on publishing uh, his findings um, in a scientific journal as well. Um, and I believe, what was the number of the volume? Yeah, so in the end, we, so by analyzing all the picture, we calculated that um, every year, this program is adding <coughs> 3,000 um, 3,700 liters of life coral on the reef. So, so you can see that's a massive uh, benefit to the reef in, in Brooklyn. Good, uh, that's it from the two of us. Um, we're happy to open it up to any questions any of you may have. Um, we'll provide any answers the best we can. And I believe Marie is still there as well. So um, she'll be happy to take any questions too. I can, I can start off with questions. Thanks so much for the um, presentation. Um, so I, I've, uh, I've done some work in a seed bank where they're, um, they're working on uh, protecting the, the seed population by storing them in very cold uh, underground storage. Is there, is there any plan of that sort? Because it, I mean, it sounds like there's a good chance corals will continue to be challenged. Is there a way to create long time storage that would maybe allow repopulation or something? Uh, I've certainly never heard of, uh, of the long term storage. Um, there is a lot of work being done genetically to try and breed what they call super corals, um, which are genetic strains of species which are more resistant to the bleaching events. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of any such thing of long term storage. There's also new techniques coming in. in things like micro fragmenting where they found particularly for the massive species, the larger sort of boulder corals, the more reef building species, and um, that they can accelerate growth from out plants by using very, very small, small fragments and placing five, six, seven, eight, nine of them together, which then grow into one um, larger colony. And they found that the growth rate in that is, is very, very quick. Um, so there are a variety of different strategies out there which are aimed at pushing restoration forward. Um, like Gaetan said, it's a relatively, in the scientific world, it's a relatively new field. Um, there is a lot of restoration which takes place around the world, um, but the biggest gap in it is, is monitoring and is working out what is the most effective path to move forward. Um, so I think in answer to your question, I, I haven't heard of any such seed bank, um, but I would also say that restoration is still at, at its infancy. Um, there's going to be a lot of changes over the coming years, and unfortunately those changes need to happen quickly because the, the decline is obviously happening very quickly as well. Um, like I have a question on like, like I have heard that like COVID helped in like reducing pollution due to like less tourists. Like, did it help the coral reefs or, or is it worse for the marine like centers because they're like less tourists to give support and all? Like, did it help or like the COVID situation? Um, I, I personally speaking, uh, I think if you reduce human activity in terms of a lot of people spending a lot of time in their houses, reducing carbon footprints, et cetera, through you know, not driving in your car every day. Um, I think you can only have a positive response. 
in terms of what I've witnessed firsthand, I haven't witnessed any uh, benefits firsthand from uh, the environment that we've been subjected to for the last year. Um, you may see those benefits in years to come, but at the moment, currently, in, in my own personal opinion, I haven't witnessed any firsthand benefits here. Yeah, because uh, what we see on a daily basis is the um, health of the core, and it's mainly influenced by the water temperature and by climate change. Change, so it will only be the consequences will only be seen in the long term. As Sam said. Thank you. Kind of in addition to that question, what about the masks? I've been hearing in the news that masks are now becoming an issue in the ocean. Is that something you're seeing, or has it not arri arrived yet? Uh, personally, again, I haven't seen any whilst underwater. Um, marine debris is a huge problem, and it's something that we face uh, daily. Um, you know, as we've talked about with the turtles, there are direct um, impacts to them. Is the ghost nets, your marine pollution, etc. Um, you know, we find rubbish here on a daily basis. It doesn't mean it's from the Maldives. It could be from a variety of different places. I'm yet to find a mask, um, but as I said, I've been on the island here since February last year. I haven't left. Um, but I haven't seen a single mask in that time. I don't know if you have you know, in the water. But again, you know, I, I agree. Um, I've seen a lot of um, PPE being washed up on beaches and not being disposed of properly. And of course, yes, it, it becomes a massive problem. Um, there are big initiatives out there already pushing people towards cloth masks, etc., reusable, um, which I think is, is a necessity as well as we move forward um, dealing with COVID. Um, I think it'll be an, another big thing that, that people will be will be pushed to do and the, and the right thing to do as well. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you talked, you mentioned earlier about the uh, government um, kind of having, uh, you know, giving support, but actually if the governments in, in every country do give support to this, actually that is a key step to taking a positive step forward. Um, you know, we're down here in Goa at the moment and normally we come to the same area every year. And this year, because of the difference in the tourists that are here, actually the beach where we are, which is normally litter free, has increased with litter because of the different kind of uh, tourist um, community that have come. And it's that lack of education, the lack of understanding and awareness. We're in the sea almost every day and, you know, the children are getting tangled up with all sorts of rubbish. So that's right at the beachfront. So the kind of, uh, the, <laughs> The amount of rubbish that is out there is is shocking and scary. And you know, I think I think now we keep saying it and we keep talking about how the government needs need I think we lost her. Anna? I mean, to the point she was alluding to is, is exactly correct. I think, you know, talking about education and outreach is a massive part of, of what we do on a daily basis here. And, and so it should be. Um, we have almost a captive audience with the guests that come to the hotels here. And, um, you know, education is paramount. I think what you're experiencing more and more is that the younger generation is, is far more environmentally aware than we give them credit for. And some of the insightful questions and, and the general interest from them into what we do is, is huge. Um, talking about governments, etc. I mean, Geta and I have this conversation all the time that what we do here on a grassroots level is vital, um, but it's not going to be successful unless we see wider scale global changes. And the two need to go hand in hand. One is no good without the other. We can't stop what we're doing simply because there aren't those big changes happening as fast as we would like because we would lose the chance of restoring these ecosystems. But similarly, 
we can't go on doing this long term because it, it's not going to be a solution. It's simply the two need to work together. And the education factor, I think, ties into that massively. I have a question. Um, like when we just um, look at this at, at this space, right? Um, like who are the big funders or is it like a lot of corporates? Like is it a lot of CSR funding? Is it government funding? Is it uh, individual HNIs, like high network individuals? Like what is, because for a big advocacy sort of coalition to form a governments to move, who do you think are the key influencers so far that have played a, big role in funding because um, saving the quality, it's also expensive as a as an initiative to to hire these people and the technology. So who do you think are the key players or funders for an initiative like this? In the Maldives? Glo globally or wherever these initiatives are happening. Yeah, maybe start with the Maldives, yeah. I think personally speaking, the, the, the hotels play a huge role here in the Maldives. They contribute so much to the economy. Um, and you know they are in a position to be able to to bring in um, restoration centres or centres such as ours, companies such as Reefscapers to work in partnership with them. I mean, I think that's all about believing um, in the need to protect the environment, and I think that's key: is the belief that you need to protect it globally. What would you think, Jim? For now, I think it's mostly from um, citizens who take steps. I mean, a lot of this work is, um, is um, volunteer work, usually. So it's people uh, grouping, um, gathering to, to take initiatives like that. But um, I mean, so the, usually when you protect the environment, it's, it's going to be against some financial interest. So it's going to be a bit tricky to, mm. to, 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 team, to team with the people who are, who are something to lose from that but uh, not always it depends like for, for instance uh, here with the hotels it's uh, it's a win-win situation if we if the environment is um is uh, completely dead uh, people won't come here anymore so it's uh, there are, there's always a few cases like this where you can partner with people who, are, who have money and who also have something to win to protect the environment could i just add on to that um so in the Maldives, we have to, you know, recognize that it's tourism industry that drives conservation. So, for example, for the sharks as well, there was a, a conflict between the fisheries and the tourism. And that's like the tourism won over because it's the, you know, it's what brings in uh, money to the country, right? It's the foreign uh, currency. Um, uh, no. So it's tourism in the Maldives does spend a lot of money on conservation. Um, and we do get a lot of funding from facility, like the Global Environment Facility, the World Bank, you know, like uh, the EU. There's so many people who give us so much money, but half the time we don't know where it goes. So if you really look at how much money has been spent or given or, you know, donors have given to, the government to implement waste management, for example. Yeah. It's tons, it's a lot. And because of the corruption, I'm sorry, I have to get into this because in this part of the world, um, there's a lot of corruption when it comes to the government, the money, the MPs, whatever. So, you know, a lot of that money is lost and it's not implemented into what it should be. Um, so for us, Yes, uh, person like for Reefscapers, Four Seasons and us, we have a really good partnership where we've managed to do a lot of work, but I've also worked in the government and, and consulted a lot for waste management, for example. And also, I think we have to realize that growing up, for example, when I grew up, there was no plastic. Like in the Maldives, we didn't have to think about plastic or you know, everything, there was no plastic to think about. And then now there's so much, especially because a lot of the Maldivians depend on bottled water for their, you know, daily drinking water. Because the, with the salt water intrusion and all the um, groundwater is, uh, is, you know, not, it's yeah. not portable, you know. 
So there's a lot of lifestyle changes that have happened. And I did a survey a hmm, long time ago um, on willingness to pay for waste management mm -hmm. in the islands. And I did buy it all where these guys are based. Uh, I went to all the inhabited islands and I spent with each uh, you know, person I talked to about an hour talking about paying like the willingness to pay for waste management and you know initially nobody wants to pay for waste they're like it's waste why do we need to pay for waste right to manage waste so it's a long process i agree there's a lot of awareness to be had um but it's also something that's not instilled in a lot of these especially the island communities we didn't grow up with plastic we didn't grow up having to manage waste everything was compostable everything just went into into the sea so it's it's a life it's a huge lifestyle change the whole world has had to deal with right and <clears throat> often it's not because they don't know about it it's not because they it's just that people don't care or we just are not hitting the right spot you know it's something i think about a lot like how to instill that because I know it got instilled in me when I went to Australia, for example, to study, you know, that, you know, I needed to think about the environment more or to, to manage or not to throw plastic around. You guys will see uh, Simon and get on, like if you're on a ferry boat, the kids even will drink a packet of Milo, whatever, and they'll just dump it, you know, the bottle into the sea, like without a second thought, right? So these habits need to change. And how do we do that, right? I know, I know there's no one answer, but yeah, I, I, I feel you. Um, my question is, um, thanks for sharing your insight towards marine life. And it was really eye-opening. And my question is, uh, what, are, uh, what are the different endangered species of turtles, uh, which has longest time span during migration. When you migrate them from one ocean to another, does it influence their life cycle? Or they are able to recuperate with new environment and new uh, conditions, living conditions? So did you notice any kind of, uh, did you have any observation regarding their lifespan and their changing uh, changing uh, conditions and all? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I, I understand fully. Um, when you say moving the turtles, do you mean from the flying turtles where they went to the zoos and aquariums? Or? Exactly, exactly. So did you notice any change in their lifespan and their conditions, their, their, uh, how they survive in new conditions? And what is their, does it change their uh, lifespan also when they migrated from one ocean to another? Uh, so we, it's not migrating them from one ocean to the other. They're going from uh, obviously the wild and then they're going into captivity purely because yeah. they're unable to, to survive in the wild anymore. So when they go into captivity, any animal, usually their life expectancy increases rather than decreases because, of course, they're provided with safety. There's no predation and they're getting a good diet, etc. Um, and as we mentioned, we actually had one of the patients who recovered in captivity and was then able to be brought back to um, its native range in the Maldives and then to be able to be released back into the ocean. Okay, thank you. I, I had a question about, um, you talked about the influence of the El Nino, um, and I think, was it 2016 with the big event? Um, so I kind of, two questions around the El Nino. Um, one, the El Nino is not new, right? So it's been, it's been part of weather patterns for a long time. Um, so are we to just understand this is exacerbated by, by climate change, that these are more intense? warming uh, events and then the second to that is you, you talk about um preparing for the next one which they have what like a nine to eleven year sequence pattern um and you talked about repopulating with the frames I, i'm curious to know what else what else is being done in, in preparation for the next one 
Yeah, so um, as you said, El Nino is a natural phenomenon. The um, thing is, because of climate change, it's being uh, more intense and more frequently intense. So before, if you, when there was a really intense El Nino, cars would die. Maybe, in a, maybe once in a while in a similar way as they do today, but then it would be much calmer for a long time. So coral reefs would have time to recover. Now the problem is that almost all El Nino's events are really intense. So um, if you just have like four or five years in between, corals don't have time to recover. So for instance, when you, when you lose 90% of the coral during one El Nino, they will start growing back very slowly. But if you've got another very intense heat wave four or five years later, you lose again 90% of what was remaining. So this way you lose a lot of coral every, every intense heat wave. And so the way we prepare for El Nino, it's uh, of course we cannot we cannot do much when the when the um, temperature of the water is increasing. And there's nothing to do, but uh, indirectly by uh, helping the coral recover after the the previous one, there will be more coral. So statistically, there will be more coral that will survive the next El Nino. There are also quite simple environmental factors that we can we can try to help by placing frames deeper, or as we talked about in the video briefly, shading some of the structures as well. Um, there's places here where, where we provide natural shade through man-made uh, items like jetties or docks or walkways. Um, and that's had some positive results as well. But as Gessen quite rightly said, you're fighting against mother nature essentially, or you're fighting against uh, you know, an adjusted mother nature by us really, so it's very difficult. Um, so by increasing those numbers, we hope to, to allow more colonies to survive in the long term. So if there are no other questions, are there any? So, um, since there are no more questions, I think we can call it uh, a wonderful session and thank the Reefscapers for taking the time out. Um, thank you. This was really, really informative for everybody here. And uh, if we all make it to the Maldives, I'm sure all of us are going to hit you up for sure. I think, I think we're all going to note that down <laughs> and we're going to find you guys. Um, of course, for the team here, I'm going to send their details. I'm going to send just the web, their website and um, um, if possible, um, Simon and team, if we can get these videos, we would love to share it. I actually have the recording so I can share this recording with people who weren't able to join. I've got a couple of emails because people have been on different time zones. I'm definitely going to share this and a couple of other YouTube links. Um, just a heartfelt thank you for taking the time out and yeah. we hope to keep in touch. Yeah, an absolute pleasure. Um, if anybody who wasn't able to join the session, if they have any questions, uh, please feel free to forward them on to me or to get them. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good evening of the day. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. No problem. Oh, 